right, let's go to Jose in, there's no way this is the name of his town, in Niceville, Florida. I love it. Jose, Niceville. Is that for real? Yes, sir. Dude, Niceville. I thought you were just giving us a fake name. Niceville. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> is it right next to like, never mind. Never mind. I was going to take us off the rails. Uh, hey, so what's up, man? Uh, first off, thank you for thank you for your call and thank you for everything you do on your show. It, it has helped me and my family out a lot. Thank you. Well, I'm really grateful, man. Thank you. So what's up? What are you, what are so you working my, through? So my question is, how do I handle anxiety when it comes to flying? So it, for whatever reason, recently, my, I get super anxious. I get nervous. I get sweaty. I get all these different emotions when I start flying. Mm. And um, I don't know. Has there been any... Uh changes in your life like new kids um did y'all recently buy a house you got other stuff going on job like jobs kind of wonky what's going on so so i've been thinking about this a lot okay so recently in the last two years my life has been amazing with my wife with my kids with my job it's like, it's like everything is flowing in place and i'm scared on losing it uh. and I don't, my wife and I have been married uh, 14 years and it hasn't been this good almost ever. (laughs) And so, so, (laughs) man, I'm smiling. Oh, dude. Jose, I feel like I'm talking to a cooler version of myself. (laughs) Um, I hate flying and I fly for a living and Mm -hmm. I hate it. And, I man, I've I've been in a season of blessing the last couple of years. It's not going to last forever, and I have begun to slowly hold on to it tighter and tighter, to the point that I'm going to start constricting it. I can already tell. Start choking it to death, right? Yeah. And when I start grabbing for control, all that phobia is uh, the fear of flying. Let's be super clear: your mortal body is in a tube a metal tube flying five or six hundred miles an hour thirty thousand feet above the air right so that's insane i think we all should be a little bit anxious about that because that's nuts (laughs) um our brains don't have an evolutionary um switch for flying in a metal tube thirty thousand feet above the air um and so we should be a little bit anxious about that but when you have started to lock in on not losing things, there's just a natural inclination to begin to hold on to things tighter and tighter and tighter. And then your body starts scanning the environment for things it cannot control and it tries to get your attention. Okay. And that's all anxiety is. It's just an alarm system. And there are fewer things more out of control than looking at two dudes that you don't even get to see. They just, you hear their voice and Mm -hmm. you just trust. Hope you guys don't kill us. Uh, (laughs) And I would like the snack, please. And um, seltzer water, right? That's just, it's, Mm -hmm. it's insanity. And so uh, here, here's what I, here's what I'm going to just tell you what I do. Okay. Okay. The first thing is, is my body starts getting anxious. I, about flying and it's a kind of a ramp up for me. I start packing. I, st- I put off packing until the very last second. And then I create a whirling dervish of chaos and I start throwing crap in. I always forget something. And then I get mad. I forgot it. Um, and then I race to the airport driving too fast. Cause I've now created a situation where I'm going to be late and I'm already amped up. And then I start getting nervous and all, all the things I literally will consciously take a deep breath and exhale and drop my shoulders down. And I will force a giant smile onto my face. And I will say to myself, sometimes out loud, like like a person who is no longer well or sane, I know you're just trying to take care of me because I'm getting ready to go flying at 30,000 feet in the air. I'm good. I'm going on this flight. And I head in that way and I literally will feel that and I'll let it run through me. And generally speaking, by the time I make it all the way to the gate and I sit down in kind of a, I'm usually pretty good. 
A couple other things that help me is gum. I chew, <laughs> I'll go through a whole pack of sugar-free gum. Not a pack of like six, but like a box of gum. Okay. I also have headphones and I've downloaded, you can get on the podcast and download like, I don't know, it sounds like yoga music or like massage music or something. Um, binaural beats is something I love. And I will just listen to those. And I just, I basically, here's what I'm accepting. That I have put my hands, my life in the hands of two men or women that I'll probably never make eye contact with. And that I'm probably not going to die. And if I do, mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do about it because I've already decided I'm going to fly. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? At that, at that point, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. The ship has sailed. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, try, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. Well, you're a boxer and they just ding the bell. So you're in a fight now. Now the only question is how badly are you going to get beat up? Or are you going to actually try to fight back? So when it comes to this, I feel it. I smile about it. I don't go to war with my body. Most of the angst with anxiety is fighting the anxiety itself or getting anxious about getting anxious. Have you gotten there yet? I have. So <laughs> yeah, for it's me, the best. It's the best. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it happens like a day before. Yep. So the day before, like I'll pack, I'll get ready. Then like, I'll take the kids out. We will go to the beach. We'll go get dinner. We'll go do something. And I, the, one of the things in my mind is like, man, what about if this is the last time I see my kids or the last time I see my wife and that whole first day is running through my mind until I get to the airport. Yeah. Then when I get to the airport, it's like, all right, don't die. <laughs> <laughs> but like how you're saying, I have no control. Yeah. So I actually think the, the question, what if this is the last day I could see my kids is a question we should all ask way, way, way more often. Cause the majority of us run through our lives as though our current situation is never going to end both good and bad. Those of us in a season of blessing, just assume we're always going to make this much money and the life, our lights are always going to be on. And there's always going to be this and the car is always going to start and the tires are never going to be flat. And then we all have a rude awakening coming for us. And those that think I'm always going to be depressed. I'm always going to be anxious. I'm always going to be just a trauma survivor. I, they have a hard time seeing this, that the sun comes up too. And so I would tell you that don't run from that. Actually sit for a minute. And I would actually do it more often than just that one day. What if it's the last day I see my kids? One of the things that I did regularly and I need to get back into it in 2023 is I would write my kids a quick letter. I just want you to know that I love you. I just want you to know that I'm so proud. I'm so grateful that I get to be your dad. And my subversive motive for that was what if this is the last time I get to see him. Yeah. I want that, that when their dad dies in a plane crash, which by the way, statistically speaking is never going to happen. <laughs> it's never going to happen. You and I, statistically speaking have way more likelihood that we're going to die in our cars, frantically driving to the airport than we are in a car in a plane rash, crash. But I wanted them to have that letter. And for some reason, writing that letter to them before I left town was good leaving a, a letter on my wife's pillow um, if she was gone already or um, right by where the coffee maker is in the morning when I knew she was going to go first thing in the morning, man, that gave me peace because mm -hmm. I get to say the last, the last words. Does that make sense? No, it does. It, ma it makes a lot of sense. I, I don't have any problem with you thinking, what if this is the last moment? I think, that's just, I think that helps us make our time a little more precious. That's an old stoic philosophy. Um, memento mori, like, Remember, we're going to die when that it's when that becomes paralyzing and I can't get on a plane and then I can't leave the house and I can't, you know what I mean? That's when it gets too far. That's when our bodies spin out on us. That's why I think showing actually getting in the car, going to the airport and smiling, dropping your shoulders and saying, ah, this is it. I'm not going to die. And if I do, nothing I can do about it because I'm getting on this plane. And by the way, real quick, Jose, I want to back out for just one second. Um, Things are really good and you've worked really good to create a non-anxious life and you're in a season of blessing. And so things like an emergency fund for if you lose your job or if something breaks on the house, uh, let me say it this way. If worrying or anxiousness is your drug, seasons of peace will feel like hell. They will feel... Um, like you're not prepared, you're not ready. It's that dream that you wake up and you're supposed to be giving a presentation at school and you haven't studied, or you're the guitarist of a band and you're suddenly on stage and you don't know how to play the song. 
And that, that dream comes to life for those of us who have lived lives of worry and anxiousness for whatever reason, seasons of peace feel very foreboding. Um, I think it's Brene Brown that says we start rehearsing tragedy. We start practicing for when it all goes down. And man, I just decided to quit living like that. I have prepared my life as much as possible for if and when things can happen. I don't have a plan for if the monetary system collapses and we're trading coffee and bullets for food. I don't have a plan for that. Um, my plan is to go find a prepper and, <laughs> and do and never mind. So I, I've planned appropriately. And now I've been in a season in the last four or five years of practicing being at peace. It's practicing. Practicing living non-anxiously. And it's been incredible because my body's adjusted. And it can gear up when it needs to, but most of the time it lives in a state of <sighs> so good. So Jose, I want you to, I want to challenge you, brother. Intentionally open your hands to your incredible marriage, to your incredible relationship with your kids, to your good situation at home and at work. Hold those things loosely because they're going to come, they're not, they're not going to come and go. Your family's not going to come and go, but there's going to be seasons of good times and seasons of tough times. And if you hang on to the, the good times so hard, you'll end up suffocating them while they're still good times. Hold on to them loosely. Build yourself a non-anxious life. And then learn practice on dealing with whatever comes. Because it's going to come anyway, right? I might as well not go to war prematurely. I might as well enjoy the peace when there's peace and enjoy the good times when they're good. And be prepared for when times get tough. And worrying and being anxious about them never helped with any of those things. I'm grateful, grateful for you, brother. And congratulations on building a non-anxious life. 